grab your popcorn and snacks, find a comfy spot, take a seat or lie down, and let me transport you to a place of fantasy, ghost stories, ancient legends, odd creatures, alien encounters, and other magical topics. You may even decide to join the conversation. From faraway lands to your own backyard, with a small dash of pixie dust, turn out the lights and open your minds. The journey is about to begin. Hey, welcome, welcome, welcome. Another great evening for California Haunts and, and a great show coming up. Uh, my name is Charlotte. I'm going to be your host for the next hour. Uh, I am the owner and operator of the California Haunts Paranormal Investigation Team uh, based out of Sacramento, California. But we are also up and down the state of California. We have 35 investigators in the state of California. But we also have branches in Washington, Oregon, Washington, sorry, Washington, Oregon, <laughs> Nevada, and Hawaii. Anyhow, I want to thank you all for coming. You can find this show at www.californiahaunts. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting confused with my websites. I have like two websites. They both have California Haunts in them. So the actual Paranormal Group website is www.californiahaunts.org. And the radio website is www.californiahauntsradio.com. So you can see how it can get kind of confusing. Anyway, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, it's cold here. Well, not cold compared to where some of you guys are, trust me. But it, 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 it does get nippy here. Uh, we're dropping down to like uh, 28 to 32 at night. So, But like I said, you know, compared to some of you guys that live in, in like Wisconsin and different places like that, this is t-shirt weather. My dad grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, that's what he used to say is we used to complain about the cold. And he'd, he'd, be, uh, he'd be looking at us like we were nuts. And I says, oh, this is t-shirt weather. So we laugh, but I, I guess that's the way it is back there. But anyway, again, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Um, we got a great show planned for you tonight. Um, this is my journalism night. You know, I am a journalist, and I love the paranormal. I love investigating the paranormal. Or I wouldn't be doing it, but there's also times that I miss being out in the field covering stories. I used to be a crime beat reporter, and and uh, I miss going to court and hearing all this, you know, and hearing all the testimony and talking with the police officers and whatnot. And so, this is my way of kind of doing that now. And uh, the gentleman we have on tonight, Mr. Gavin Schmidt, has done research on the mob, and. Uh, we're going to be taught tonight. We're going to be talking about Milwaukee, which kind of surprised me. I know, you know, you, you know, the mobs around, we had mob even here, uh, but uh, you never think about a place like Milwaukee or whatever, because you always hear about New York or Chicago, places like that. But tonight uh, we're going to find out a, a lot of details about what happened, you know, what, what has been going on or what went on in Milwaukee. So without further ado, I'm going to bring Gavin in and, start this thing off how's that sound hello sir hello can you actually hear me i can hear you beautifully okay good then we're then we're set <laughs> tell me about you how did you get into doing this stuff completely backwards uh not uh not law enforcement i'm not uh, a historian by training although that's what i do now I just am a person with a lot of curiosity, and there wasn't much out there on the Milwaukee mob. In fact, just as you suggested, everybody knows Chicago and New York, but right. nobody knows Milwaukee. So I, being a Wisconsin person, when I found out there is something right in my own backyard, I'm curious. I want to know more, and it's, uh, it's become a can of worms where every time I learn something, I have another question. So it, it's... I've been doing this for 10 or 15 years now, and I don't think I'm ever going to stop. <laughs> it's just that I don't see an end. It's interesting to me because I know I found out, like with Sacramento, um, <clears throat> there's a there's a few um, speakeasy. Well, it used to be speakeasies on, along the river, and it never occurred to me, you know, because of prohibition and all that, it never occurred to me that the mob was actually here. But I remember the people that that own the own the, the hotels telling me that. You know that that when guys would go bad or, or something would go down, you know they would dump the bodies in the river. You know, <laughs> so it shocked me because you know you you just don't think about that. Like you say, you don't think about it in your own hometown. Oh yeah, uh, you know, and it it varies city to city, state to state. I mean, I, I don't think we're going to see a lot of mob activity in maybe Montana or Wyoming, yeah. but 
but anywhere that somebody wants a drink and it's not legal or somebody wants to to gamble and it's not legal or they want a, a pretty lady and it's not legal for what they want to do uh you know it's somebody has to fill that market so uh no matter where you are there's somebody willing to fill that market absolutely so tell me about the ma you know the the, the mafia influence in milwaukee when, when, when did it all start up uh as best i can tell it really kicked off in the beginning of the 1900s. I'm, I'd say about 1903. And it's, you know, it could be give or take a few years, but that's when I know for sure that there were mob guys in Milwaukee actively doing things that we would call mob activity. And it just sort of took off from there. And the same things we see in Chicago, New York, or anywhere else, you see in Milwaukee, you see the bootlegging, you see the gambling, you see the prostitution, you see um, them threatening people who, if they don't pay, we're going to bomb your house. I mean, it's it's like cookie cutter. Anywhere in, in the United States, or even Canada for that matter, <clears throat> it, it's like they were doing the exact same playbook in every city throughout the, you know, North America. So I don't know if they were all like, sharing tips with each other or what but it seems like you can check at any point in time and and it was the same thing going on everywhere well you know when we people my age i'm not gonna say how old i am because you know but uh, <laughs> when we think of milwaukee i think of happy days and laverne and shirley you know yeah, sure. that it's like that you don't think about the that whole underworld thing going on no that's that's fair and really Milwaukee likes to pride itself as being what they call a city of neighborhoods. Uh, even though it's the biggest city in Wisconsin, it's still really just a small town at heart. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it is that happy days. It is, you know, everybody knows everybody. Maybe there's a million people, but somehow you know everybody one way or another. Um, so, yeah, you don't think about it in that way. But, you know, again, like I say, anywhere you have a group that wants to supply a, a business that other people are looking for. It's there. I mean, for a while, you know, pornography was hard to come by now as easy as, you know, anything, but, but for a while it's hard to come by. Well, you got to have somebody who's willing to do that. So no matter where you go, Milwaukee's no exception. You see it across the board and uh, I mean, we can get into specifics if you want, but it just in general, it, Although in the daytime, yeah, it is that happy days kind of a place. It's, it's there's still, you know, it's all the market. The market decides whether the mob lives or dies. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so who were the uh, prominent mobsters in Milwaukee? It depends on the time period, but by far the most well known was a man named Frank Balistrieri, and Frank Balistrieri is said to have become the mob boss in the early 1960s and he stayed on top all the way up through the 1980s when he served out the remainder of his life in prison um, but he was involved in just about anything that you know the mob had its fingers in but he got really known on a national level because he helped supply the teamsters money to purchase the Stardust and a couple other casinos in Vegas for the mob. So uh, Milwaukee was a really key piece to that Midwest mob getting into Vegas situation. So uh, he was known for that. In fact, the front man, the, the, you know, the clean guy you got to put out front uh, mm -hmm. was a man named Alan Glick and Alan Glick just passed away this last year. And yeah. And, and Glick wouldn't have been there without Frank Balistrieri, and Frank Balistrieri couldn't have been there without Alan Glick. So uh, it was kind of like one of the last pieces of the puzzle disappeared last year. Now, when you say um, earlier, when you started the interview about them, like all all, all being in the same play, playbook or, you know, being in contact with each other, that might, could that be true? I mean, I mean, obviously, like the people in New York, how to say and what went on in Milwaukee and stuff, right? To a, to a point. Yeah. I mean, every mob city is independent. I mean, the, when you're the boss, you're the boss. I mean, you okay. do what you want. You don't really answer to anybody, but yes, the, there's some truth to that where every so often they would have uh, national meetings. Um, mm -hmm. They had one in Chicago. They had some in New York. 
Uh, you said you were from Cleveland originally. There was yeah. a famous mob meeting at the Statler Hotel in Cleveland at one point. So yeah, they did. They did periodically get together, and you know, we don't always know what they discussed. But but the point is, the important part is, is that we know that all these guys, whether they lived in New York, Milwaukee, or Los Angeles, they knew each other. Sure. You know, they maybe didn't talk on a day to day to day basis, but they knew who their guys were that they could cooperate with. So so yeah, I don't know if it comes down to like actually you know, literally saying this is what we're going to do this year. I don't know if it's quite that detailed, but I wouldn't be surprised if they talked about things that maybe worked or didn't work and that sort of thing. It's 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 a lot of speculation because the, the mob is very bad at keeping records, so we, we don't always know. Right, right, right. So what were some of the more... Um... The more outstanding things that the, the, that the mob did that 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 that, that come to mind. Well, uh, it varies. You know, in Milwaukee, of course, there's there's the union thing, uh, the Teamsters Union, where they uh, worked their way in, so they had influence over the pension fund. And this is like a famous thing that most people have at least vaguely heard about. This is kind of like leads into the disappearance of Jimmy Hoffa, which is not a Milwaukee thing, but right. it all, it's all part of that same story where the mob had different angles they could approach the Teamsters, get a handle on their money, and then use it for other things. The big one, like I said, was Vegas, but they would do other strange things too. Like in Milwaukee, they used the Teamsters' money to purchase the world's largest tuna fishing boat not something that you associate with the mafia, yeah. but they were using money, other people's money, to invest in this fishing business, which, long story short, didn't work out very well. <laughs> um, the thing that Milwaukee really got known for was the vending machine business, which is something, again, you don't normally, when you think of the mob, you, you think of gambling and you think of other things. Yeah. like, and they, and they did that. There was plenty of that, but the thing that Milwaukee did that really is different from other cities was they were very deep into vending machines. And and you might say, well, vending machines, how is that even a mob thing? And it's actually, it's, it's quite clever because vending machines are a cash business. Mm -hmm. I mean, now it's all computerized and everything else. But once upon a time, they were just these machine, these mechanical machines. You put the money in, you take the money out. You tell the IRS whatever you want to tell the IRS. I mean, there's nobody doing the accounting on these machines. And then depending on what they're selling, you got to mark up there. Um, you and I are old enough, again, to allude to our ages. You and I are old enough that we remember that it wasn't that long ago that you could buy cigarettes in all kinds of restaurants and bars and everywhere else. And imagine that. Imagine that the mob finds cartons and cartons of cigarettes that fall off the truck. Mm -hmm. They bring them to these vending machines. They put them in. So they've got the cigarettes for free. They're marking up the prices on them. And then when they have to report their income at the end of the year, they don't even have to report half of it because who knows? Those right. machines, nobody monitoring that. So it's, it's very mundane. It's not very glamorous. But it's actually a really clever moneymaker for trying to sell things that you got for cheap under the table. That is. That makes a lot of sense. Um, what about, uh, I, I know we, we talked about gambling and stuff, but I'm sure with Prohibition, everybody was into that sort of thing, you know, yeah. as far as the mob went. So was there a lot of booze moving through Milwaukee? Yes and no. Milwaukee is actually a strange anomaly in the Prohibition story. Uh, other parts of Wisconsin, Prohibition was huge. Uh, like the other major city in Wisconsin is Madison, the capital city. I'm not sure how much your your viewers are familiar with Wisconsin, but but the other one is Madison. And Madison, Prohibition was a big deal because they had a very serious law and order outlook. But they also had the college there. They had UW-Madison. And I don't know if people know this, but college kids like to drink. Right. So, 
So it was a it was a real problem there where they actually really cracked down hard, but they also had this key demographic. Milwaukee is so, sort of different in that it had a very strong German tradition, Irish tradition. Um, it's kind of what Milwaukee is known for originally as being, you know, Miller, Pabst, Schlitz, Blatz, right. right down the line. So, you know, you can outlaw beer, but it isn't like it became all that difficult to get a drink. So, so yes, the mob was involved in speakeasies in Milwaukee, but you didn't even necessarily have to go to the mob because if you came from that family background of being German, Irish, you know, not the stereotype, but, right. but they did. That was, that was part of the culture. So just about anybody knew how to make their own beer in their, you know, in their basement or their barn if they really wanted to. So, and actually, I think it was in less demand here than in other places just because the police didn't care. And even already, so like Prohibition ran from 1920 to 1933. And in 1925, so not even halfway through, the state passed a law saying, we're not enforcing this anymore. So if the federal agents caught you, you were in trouble. But if the local police caught you, they were under no obligation to turn you over to the feds because the state politicians decided that they weren't on board anymore because it just wasn't politically popular with Wisconsinites. That's so, funny. Yeah, so it's it's actually a very strange story compared to the national story uh -huh. because Wisconsin's a drinking state. I mean, that's nothing new. It's been like that a long time. Now, when you started doing the research, um, how did you go about doing that? A couple of different ways. Uh, originally, of course you attack it by going after the newspapers. Mm -hmm. So the newspaper archives are a good way of finding things, but they only get you so far. Uh, first of all, you have to know what you're looking for, but that's not that hard. Um, but then you have to go to the deeper level. So for me, my main source has always been FBI documents. I also use police documents and other court documents. I've been to the National Archives. I've been to the State Historical Society. But for me, the FBI is really the, the backbone of the research. And uh, I had never requested things from the FBI at that point when I started. But I had grown up, and my grandmother would take me uh, family history searching, genealogy searching. So... I was comfortable going to courthouses and, and getting old records. You know, there's a difference between birth and death and marriage records and somebody's criminal record, but it's not really all that different. So it was just sort of a, a step where, you know, you go out there and you say, well, what am I looking for and who has it? You file that request and they send you what they have. And the FBI has been very good to me. Uh, whatever my first couple requests were, I don't even remember anymore but they were very good about it. They sent me a response. And the problem I ran into is with FBI documents. When somebody else is mentioned in them, mm -hmm. if that other person has an FBI file, their file number is listed in the margin. So like they use that internally to cross-reference. But for me, being a terribly curious person, all that did is it opened that can of worms that I said at the beginning. <laughs> because... As soon as I see there's another number, I know there's another file. Mm -hmm. As soon as I'm, so I was like, okay, I got to get this file. And then I get another file. And then, of course, there's going to be more numbers written in that one. And it, that's been sort of the ongoing thing for the last, like I say, 10, 15 years at this point. Because I don't have, when I see a number, unless it's something so obviously outside of my realm of interest, Mm -hmm. I'm just going to instinctually say, oh, I better get that. So so it grows to the point where I actually have, I have so many records now that I haven't even fully gone through and taken notes out of because I've just, because I get the material too quickly, <laughs> um, which is a good problem to have. So. Right, right. How long did it take you to write the book? First book, a couple years. I don't remember exactly. 
it's quicker after that. Mm-hmm. Um, when you write multiple books, it's quicker because you'll, you'll have leftover material from the first one and you've run across so many things doing the research that you didn't use. So the, the second time or the third time will be quicker. But the first time, oh, I mean, I'm not even sure because the writing doesn't take all that long, but you know, taking into account all of the material gathered and all, you know, having to read through that. And I mean, it's, it's years because you have to know so much more than what actually ends up in there. Like, I don't know if people know this about, I don't, and I, and I write nonfiction. I can't speak to writing fiction, but, right. but for nonfiction, I mean, you probably don't put 5% of what you picked up into the finished product. So you can just imagine how many hundreds, thousands of pages you read that never end up in a book. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I couldn't give you an exact time, but yeah, I mean, it takes quite a, if you want to be thorough, mm-hmm. you end up reading so much more that just never makes the cut. So it's a, it's a process. <laughs> I can understand that. I'm, I'm, probably, I'm, I'm writing one myself. So I, yeah. I get it. I get it. Um, oh, absolutely. When you talk about the, the, the mobsters themselves, obviously you, 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 you talked about the head guy this you know, a little while ago. Who are the lieutenants in all this? The lieutenants, okay. Um, again, it depends on the years, but if we're talking Frank Balistrieri, mm-hmm. um, under underneath him, he's got a couple guys, but his his number one guy underneath him is a man named Steve DeSalvo. And Steve DeSalvo um, kind of handled the day-to-day business. For, for those who people who aren't that familiar with how the mafia works, the mob boss, generally speaking, doesn't get his hands dirty. He's not the one out there, you know, collecting the money. He's not the one out there breaking kneecaps. He sits in his fancy suit in an office, and he can deny that he knows anything. Steve DeSalvo is the dirty work guy. He goes out there. He goes to the different bookies in town, and if they're not paying the cut they're supposed to pay, they're going to get, you know, slapped around for a while, maybe worse. Um, He's out there uh, just making sure things get done. He passes the orders on to everybody else. Um, He does, he's involved in a number of things himself, but he's also like the middleman between even the lower guys. Mm -hmm. The other, the other one would be Frank's brother, Peter Balistrieri. Peter really didn't do dirty work, Mm -hmm. but he was kind of the front man for the businesses. Frank couldn't, really own any of the businesses. He had served some time for tax problems, which is the classic right. mob prison story. And after being in prison for taxes, I mean, he he owned several bars and nightclubs and things like that. But even though everybody knew that he was the owner, he could not be the owner in public because he couldn't own the licenses to get the liquor and everything else. So his brother was basically the face, even though anybody, you know, who worked in those clubs or musicians that appeared there, everybody knew that the brother really was just the face. He didn't do anything, but, but so he was, he was a crucially important guy, even though he wasn't, as far as I know, he wasn't a violent guy. He wasn't doing dirty stuff, but he was crucial to keeping the day-to-day operations running the actual public part of it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then beneath the lieutenants, you got the other guys, right? You, you got you got the enforcers. Yep. Uh, so again, around this time, we've got a couple guys. We've got a man named Frank Stello, and Frank Stello, uh, despite the name, kind of sounding Italian, he was actually a Polish guy. And that's uh, another thing about Milwaukee. Milwaukee's got that German Polish tradition. So even though the mafia, by definition, is Italian. Right. They were they weren't against having other people uh, involved helping them out. So Frank Stello was a big uh, guy in and out of prison many times for violent crimes, and and he would be the guy who, if you saw him coming, you knew you were in trouble. Uh, you might get your legs broken. Uh, we know of at least one murder he was involved in. He was probably involved in a couple of murders, but it's very hard to actually pin a murder on a specific guy. 
that's kind of what they're good at is is the mob murders i mean in the history of milwaukee there's dozens of mob murders but mm -hmm. they never get solved so you never really know who did it but he he was a guy who was good for that it was another guy named joe guerrera who just everybody called him joey g and same thing uh, he would go around and he would you know if you see him coming you know you're in trouble because right. he's not he's not the intelligent number crunching guy he's not you know doing that part of it he's a physical guy so if you see him he's there because he's going to get something done he's not going to have a polite conversation with you so well that was my other question too with these guys was that you know from the research i've done you know in in, in my career these uh, guys, uh, like you say, they don't necessarily have to be Italian to be in, in the mob as enforcers. Mm -hmm. However, they can never be made men, right? Correct. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and, and part of that, I think, is is a Milwaukee thing. I think part of that is just because they're close to Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, pe people who are familiar with the Chicago outfit, the Chicago version of the mafia, it's there are many guys in Chicago who aren't remotely Italian who – who are key figures or were key figures there. And so it's, there's kind of like that Midwest variation, but yeah, you're absolutely right. You can be very important, mm -hmm. but you can't actually be made. And, and what difference that actually means in day to day life. I'm not sure. I mean, it's probably more just an honor than anything else, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, you're absolutely right. You could never become the boss. They would never make a non-Italian guy boss. Right, right, so, right. So I guess it, there's, it has that. It does limit you to some extent. And then, you know, it's, 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 even though it's, it's like a brotherhood, you still, a lot of these guys were still looking over their shoulders because, I mean, if, if they fell out of favor with somebody. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the chances, <laughs> the chances of getting killed were, were there, you know, cause, because I mean, the, the, as, as the story says, there's the, you know, the whole thing about the thieves, you know, the, the thieves can't, you, see, thieves, you, you know what I mean? I'm trying to get the words out. I don't know why I can't get the words out, but just that um, th there's no honor among thieves. Right. Yeah. yeah there's, there's, a there's a book uh, about Bugsy Siegel, not a Milwaukee guy, but there's right. a book about him and the, and the book is called, we only kill each other. Yeah. And and that's I mean really that's about it. Of the mob guys are for the most part there's exceptions, but for the most part they're only killing other mob guys. So once you're in the mob, you suddenly become more likely to be killed by your own guys. Yes. <laughs> so, uh and um uh, we have, uh, my friend and I have a Milwaukee Mafia podcast, just pitching that out there for people who don't know. If, if you want to hear more stories, we do have that. But that's something that comes up from time to time is that if you're in the mob and you're killed, there's a pretty good chance that one of your best friends is the guy who did the job. Sure. I mean, because it's, it's, they send after you the person that, you know, can get close to you, hang out with you, not realize that anything bad is going on. And mm -hmm. then you're done. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> Makes you feel comfortable and boom, yeah. <laughs> and so yeah, like you're saying, yeah, you're looking over your shoulder, but really it's it's going to be the person you're not looking over your shoulder. Right, right. It's game over. What are some uh, stories that, that, that you can share with us uh, about the mob there? Oof, that's such a general question. Uh, <laughs> Go for it. We're free for all here. We don't care. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's there's things that I find interesting. I, I mean, I find all of it interesting, even the boring right. I find interesting. But there's there's one story in the 1950s where a couple Milwaukee guys somehow through the grapevine they caught wind that there was a guy in Reno, Nevada, who was just a multimillionaire, but he hated banks, so he kept all his money in his house. So they drove all the way from Milwaukee to Reno, which is quite a distance. Oh, yeah. And they got to his house. They made sure he was gone. They they got the dog out of the way. They, they fed the dog some, uh, some snacks to get the dog on their side. And uh, 
they broke in and they did. And it, it turned out this guy collected silver dollars and he just had pillowcases and suitcases full of silver dollars because he wouldn't put them in the bank. And they hauled these back to Milwaukee. Of course, they ultimately end up getting caught, which is how we know about it. <laughs> but it's a, it's a really, I love that story just because there's some weird twists and turns. One, the incredible distance that they traveled. But two, the guy they robbed from was a guy named Levere Redfield. And he was very eccentric. And not just the, the bank's thing, but when they went and they talked to him, the police and the media, you know, he wasn't even all that upset. He was like, this is probably my own fault. Hmm. You know, I probably shouldn't do things the way I do them. That's too bad. And then they asked him what his dog's name was. And he said... I can't tell you what my dog's name is because he's really embarrassed about it. (laughs) So like this is really strange guy and it makes it, it makes it more entertaining because they end up getting caught despite the fact that he's not even really pushing them to investigate. Like he's more or less just been like, well, it's my own fault. So um, I like that. I like that story. There's being Wisconsin. There's of course a cheese factory story. So that's that's another fun one. I don't know if you want to hear the cheese yeah, let's factory. Yeah, hear the cheese factory story. Yeah, all right. So the cheese factory, uh, which still exists today, it's clean now. It's legit, but mm-hmm. but it was it was a mob backed cheese factory that originally was invested in by a bunch of guys out of Chicago, and maybe it's coincidence, maybe it's something to do with the cheese business. But they all started killing each other within the, within about five years of the 1940s. Almost everybody who's invested in this business has been shot in one way or another, taken out, dumped in sewers. It's, it's a mess. I mean, just several guys. And so they hand over the business to a guy not connected with Chicago. And he seemingly, at first, he seemingly runs it without any controversy but it turns out that he is backed by Joe Bonanno, who is this major New York mobster. Mm-hmm. So even though they're in like the middle of Wisconsin, and this guy is friends with the mobsters in Milwaukee, he's also got his connection in New York. Him and Joe Bonanno go to Sicily, where they go to a meeting where it's discussed how to import heroin into the United States. And long story short, there's a method they devise of getting it into the United States through cheese, olive oil, and other imported ingredients. So this cheese factory, along with other cheese factories, end up becoming sort of a conduit for drugs uh, in the area. And this is a method they would use again and again. Now, this is... Uh, at the time that they're doing this is like 1957, I believe. But as late as the 1980s, this was still something that was going on, not in the Wisconsin factory anymore, but in other places. And it ultimately became known as as the Pizza Connection. It's uh, There was a famous case called the French Connection, which most people have probably heard of, at right. least because of the movie. But then, so they, they played off of that and they called it the Pizza Connection because Sicilians were importing heroin through these pizza supplies and then distributing them throughout the country through pizza parlors and cheese factories. And, um, and Wisconsin ended up a different factory ended up playing a role in that later on. Um, so it's weird. Like what does buying and selling cheese have to do with heroin? Absolutely nothing. But for whatever reason, that's how they figured would be the sneakiest way to get it in from Sicily to the United States. That's cool. Yeah. That is really cool. Who do you think, who do you think out of, out of, uh, out of all the guys that, that, that you've done research on, who do you think was the most colorful? There's a variety of guys who, who I could say the, the one who comes to mind, the guy who like is my go-to guy for that kind of a question, is a man named Sam Vermilio. And Sam Vermilio, um, his mob nickname was Banjo Eyes, 
no idea what that means. Right. But but that's what they called him. And he was involved in any number of things. He was involved in counterfeiting, narcotics, gambling, um, a suspect in a few murders. And he was in Milwaukee, but he had strong connections to other places like Detroit and other Midwest cities. Um, some guys up in Canada. So he had some pretty good, pretty good things. And when he was caught one of the times, they caught him with a notebook. And the notebook had all these names and phone numbers in it. And that that is so fascinating to me because it goes back to sort of that national meeting thing was that this guy who is like a no-name guy who hangs out in Milwaukee and Detroit has this notebook full of like an endless list of mobsters and their phone numbers. And they find out from this that not only is he dealing in narcotics, he's dealing in in cigarettes, which cigarettes was a major business because I think this is still true today, but there's some states where there's practically no taxes whatsoever on the cigarettes. And then there's some states where there's significantly higher taxes. Right. And so you could actually make a profit. Not You don't even have to steal the cigarettes. If you just got the truck to go from the one state to the other state, the markup would be that great. So he was involved in that. And that's not legal because you have to have the specific stamps on the packs that are state specific. But, you know, who's who's watching that? You know? Right, right, right. So he does that. Eventually, one of the times he's caught, they threaten to deport him if he doesn't start squealing on other guys. He doesn't do that. So they deport him. Less than a year later, He's back in the country. He took a boat back. He couldn't get in because he was marked, you know, not welcome. Right. So the boat comes within however, you know, quarter mile or less to the shore. He jumps off and swims to the shore. So he's back in a second time before they eventually catch him and have to deport him again. And he's still to this day, he's got um, like grandchildren who live in the Midwest and they don't ever know what happened to him. After he got deported the second time, they never heard from him again. Hmm. So did he live the rest of his life in peace and quiet in Sicily? Or was he always on the run? We don't know. So that's a guy. That's a really broad overview. But, I mean, it's, that's a guy who I'm just fascinated by connections. The links between people is something that really, really grabs me. And he's a guy who... Really, not a famous name, not well-known, not even well-known in Milwaukee, but he clearly could move around freely. He knew people everywhere, and I think that's that's more interesting than some of the scams these guys were pulling, was just the, the links they had. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now that you opened that up, tell me about some of the scams. We, we talked about the vending machines, but what else did they have going on? All right, so... This again, not the most glamorous. I'm just doing what's coming, popping in my head. There so, you go. <laughs> uh, again, 1950s. This is like 1958. Uh, scam they had is these guys bought out a like a discount store, mm -hmm. uh, like a like a place where like distressed stuff would go, secondhand stuff, returns, whatever. I'm not sure what the real technical term for it is but they bought out this store the original store owner had been in business for decades he died and they bought the store from his widow and they asked the widow if they could keep the store name and she said well yeah of course you can keep the store name so what they did is immediately within days of buying this business they send out thousands of postcards to wholesalers throughout the country saying Hey, we want to buy some of your stuff. Send us catalogs. You can rely on us. We're good guys. Check out our credit rating. Look us up on the Better Business Bureau, all this and that. And of course, you know, at this moment in time, this is all true. Their credit rating is fantastic. Their mm -hmm. Better Business Bureau rating is fantastic because this guy's been in business for decades. He's reliable. But, you know, they haven't changed over the paperwork yet. So all these places are sending them catalogs and then they're ordering 
thousands and thousands and thousands. I mean, it ends up being somewhere near a million dollars worth of merchandise. <laughs> they get that brought in. They then ship it first to Chicago, then to Cleveland. And they get it out of there. And then they declare bankruptcy. And so all of a sudden now there's almost a million dollars in merchandise that isn't getting paid for because they just declared bankruptcy. So they're, you know, kind of sort of off the hook. And these other places that they, they shipped it to paid pennies on the dollar for it. They're just as crooked as the original guys. But then they claim, well, we legitimately bought it. I mean, they sent us an invoice. We paid the invoice. So even though they know darn well this stuff is stolen or something is wrong with it because they're, they're getting it dirt cheap, they end up doing, they end up basically getting away with it because they've got the invoice. I mean, they paid it. Uh-huh. They could de- they could deny they knew anything. So it's got this this whole scam where they they order things under a false, basically a false business name, sell it off for pennies on the dollar. They turn a profit because they didn't pay for it. They're declaring bankruptcy. Their friends and these other businesses are turning a profit because they're buying it for dirt cheap and then selling it at full price in their stores. So it's, it's again, not super glamorous, right. but it's but it's an awful clever scam that, that they've got going on here. So they've got their, their mob friends in Chicago and Cleveland and even Detroit um, all kind of buying this stuff, which right. on paper is legal. It's Everybody knows it's wrong. Everybody knows it's stolen. It's fraud. It's whatever. But on paper, nobody really had done anything wrong. Mm-hmm. And then by the time it gets it gets to court, I mean, the, the only way that anybody can get in trouble is if they start testifying against each other. They're not going to do that. Mm-hmm. So it's just they, but the vast majority of them end up getting away with it. Some of the original two of the original guys end up getting in some trouble for uh, lying about the bankruptcy. They do some things that, that you know, very technical stuff. Right. But but generally speaking, most of these guys got away with it. So. It's, it's interesting. It's interesting to me because, I mean, you always think of, uh, of 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 these guys on the lower on the lower tiers as not being so bright, but they were. They they were sharp enough to figure that stuff out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's. I guess you could debate how much they know and how much you know they're being directed. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but you're absolutely right. There there are some lower guys who were involved in some bigger money things that you might naturally assume. So, yeah, definitely. Because, I mean, if, if I understand the way it, it's supposed to work is that the lower guys are the ones that are feeding the money back up to the higher guys. So they're the ones that are always working out the scams, whether it's parking meters or, 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 or like you say, vending machines or whatever. You know, they have to sit there and plan this stuff out and figure it out. Right. No, that's absolutely right. There's, there's that, that kicking up system of, of the money. And, yeah, usually the lowest guys are – you know, armed robbers, burglars, you know, there it this isn't the case in Milwaukee. Milwaukee wasn't really right. a drug city, but but for the drugs, the drug network, same thing. I mean, you got your nickel and dime guys on the bottom, but then you got your multimillionaire guys at the top whose hands are clean, but everybody's kicking up profits and uh you know, it's the same thing, whether it's drugs, it's gambling or, you know, stuff that they stole you know, from a warehouse in the middle of the night. It's all the same thing. The money moves upward, and the, the guys on the bottom don't ever really get anywhere. <laughs> Which um, is the same as any well, other business, I suppose. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> just go to a normal job sometimes, you know yeah. what I mean? It's like that, too. Um, was there, uh, you know, as, as, as far as all that goes, was, was there any animal? Well, obviously people were, you know, killing each other, you know, at, at points when they were ordered to. Sure. But I mean, there was really, was there really any infighting amongst the guys? I mean, like for different scams and stuff. Uh, I'm not sure, but for different scams, there okay. were definitely points in time where they would break into factions. Mm-hmm. Where, um, there again in the, in the 1950s seems to be my theme this evening. Mm-hmm. In the in the 1950s, like they. Some of the guys didn't like the current boss, and they kind of rebelled and 
two of them ended up getting killed, and the third guy ended up getting basically banned. They, he got kicked out of the city. Um, so there was that. And then later on, when, when Frank Balistrieri was the boss, a similar thing happened where there were there was a faction of guys who didn't like the way he was running things. Mm -hmm. And it never reached that point where they had to start taking them out. But they did. They did have discussions amongst themselves about actually you know, assassinating him, which they never did. They didn't actually carry it out. But but it got up to that point, and the FBI was listening in because the FBI, as I'm sure many people know, uh, were, were hiding microphones all over the place. Right. So they they hear these these pissed off guys being like, you know, we'll just we'll just wait outside till he comes out and we'll shoot him with a twenty two. You know, they'll talk about this and and that and yeah. So <laughs> it, it definitely came up. <sighs> Gotta get there. there we go. Definitely came up, but uh, it never really reached that point. The, the killing definitely seems to have slowed down. It was very big in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. It seems to have slowed down gradually after that. And I'm not sure if that's like there was more stability or maybe it just became more dangerous as like, you know, detective work got better. I'm not exactly sure why, but, sure. but the killing each other did seem to slow down. And another question is, one does not decide that they're going to become a, a, a hitman or anything like that and with, an, with a paper application. How, I mean, how did these guys get into life? Good question. Uh, there seems to be, from what I can tell, there seems to be two ways. One is you're more or less born into it. Mm -hmm. Most of these guys have fathers or uncles or brothers or somebody in it. Um, you know, they're called mafia families, and a lot of times they are literal families mm -hmm. because most of these guys have some connection already. So there is that. But then the other thing is I refer to it as, like, the farm team, and I don't know if people know what that means when I say it, but... But, like, if you're in a gang, and I don't know, you know, what draws people into a gang. I mean, that's a sociology question. But but there's, like, if you're in a gang, I think that the mob kind of notices that. And you might end up staying in the gang. You might end up growing out of it. You know, because most of these guys are teenagers. Mm -hmm. They might end up growing out of it like most of us do. A lot of us had, you know, we had some rough teenage years, but we, we grew out of it. But, uh, but yeah, then there's other guys who the mob's like, this guy doesn't have trouble getting his hands dirty, you know? Mm -hmm. He doesn't mind robbing a bar. He doesn't mind doing this and that. And I think, you know, they kind of look out for that, and you get brought under someone's wing. Again, I mean, a lot of the specifics are hard to say because, you know, we don't, we don't have records. We don't have the, the job application, as you say. Uh, I wish we did. I mean, it would be such amazing information. But but a lot of this is just sort of we have to piece it together. Some of it's speculation. I wish it wasn't because you know, speculation is not the best method of history. Um, and then a lot of it we hear from informants, which isn't always the best either because right. informants, uh, although I find them generally reliable, you have to understand that they're not always telling the full story. And they're usually telling you something because they're getting something out of it, too. Mm -hmm. So it, when an informant tells you some information, keep in mind why they're telling you what they're telling you and what they're not telling you. Um, mm -hmm. Or, you know, I mean, they're not telling me, but in, in my case, when I'm reading it in an FBI file, why were they disclosing the specific things they were and what did, were they not saying? Because, of course, they're not going to get themselves in trouble. Right, right. Um, you know, when these guys would be out on the streets, or, or, or the general public would be out on the streets, were they highly, re you know, re gosh, I think my mouth just doesn't want to work tonight. Were they <laughs> highly recognizable? As, as far as what? Like, as far as like, you know, like like when you think of something like, uh, I'm thinking of a Bronx tale, you know, where, where, where they were like two doors down at the bar hanging out, you know, the, the, the main guy. Were they that recognizable to the people on the streets? You know, like, like the normal people that were living there. 
I'm not sure if you would know just by seeing someone that you would know that, but I think it was it was kind of an open secret. Okay. I mean, anybody who's in the mafia isn't typically going to say I'm in the mafia. Right. I mean, you, you try to deny that, but I think it was kind of known. Um, and Milwaukee again is a as a fairly small town as far right. as big cities go. Uh, the Italian community in Milwaukee uh, really like at its peak before it started thinning out, you know, and becoming more mainstream, not specifically ethnic was like at its peak like three thousand people so everybody knew everybody so you know it's not like you see a guy and you see him in a pinstripe suit and you're like oh that guy's a mob guy it would be like oh that's jack he's probably in the mob it's like you you would already know who they were by sight without you know having to see whether they were wearing the team colors or not so (laughs) Yeah, all the chat room says, yeah, like Tony Soprano. <laughs> yeah. Something yeah. like that, yeah. Yeah. Um, were there payoffs going on? I mean, I mean, were, were they having the bit, you know, having to get money from businesses to, you know, protect the businesses? Was, was it that kind of deal going on, or, or was it just a general, well, doing these other scams? There was some of that. Uh, it's, we only know again. We only know when they get caught or when somebody comes forward. Right. So there, there may have been more going on. Um, a lot of times, it was more like the illegal things the bookies are paying to to operate. Um, but we do know there are legitimate businesses. There was like a bakery of all things. A bakery had to pay um, because if they didn't pay, they were going to get bombed. And at one point, they did get bombed, mm-hmm. which is how we kind of we found out about it. Um, who else is paying? Oh, the vending machine operators sure. are, are paying. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure exactly. There's there's other exceptions where if we know things are going on that aren't supposed to be going on, you might be paying the protection money. Um, you know, if you if you're like an adult bookstore or during prohibition, there might have been certain speakeasies that that paid. Mm-hmm. It's it's a really tough, that's a tough one because so much of that I don't think gets reported. I mean, there was a, there was an allegation that a Green Bay Packer, I don't know if people know the Green Bay Packers. This is a very long time ago now, but there was a Green Bay Packer called Max McGee. And there was a rumor that Max McGee was paying, like he had a restaurant. Uh, he was retired from football and he had a restaurant and he was allegedly paying to stay open and then when the fbi went and talked to him he's like no i don't know what you're talking about so it's it's hard to say i mean was this just some rumor that somebody had going around or was it true and he just didn't want to tell them i don't know that's it's again it's another one of these problems where we only know when things you know lead to arrests or you know the court or something like that because so many people who are getting threatened aren't going to admit to it and the people doing the threatening obviously aren't going to admit to it. So it's it's a tough game, a tough research game. Absolutely. Now, in doing your research, what stood out the most to you? Stood out the most? Yeah. Wow. They're such big questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if it stood out the most, but what stands out to me It's just that there's these stories. These stories exist. And I find that fascinating because everybody, like not just in the Midwest, not just in the United States, pretty much everybody in the world has heard of Al Capone. Mm -hmm. And I got nothing against Al Capone. I mean, if people find that fascinating, that's great. But I guess what really strikes me is just how many stories we all have in our state or our region, what have you, that are some great stories, you know, whether they're true crime or anything else. Mm-hmm. And and we get hung up on, on Al Capone or, uh, or John Gotti or, you know, these, sure. these huge flashy names. Right. And, and here I am, I'm like the local historian guy. And I'm like, Hey, you know, you don't have to go to Chicago or New York for your stories. You've got all these stories here. 
And I guess that jumps out at me because there's so many stories I come across. Mm -hmm. And even though, you know, maybe they're not big stories, a lot of them are Mm -hmm. not that exciting. There's still stories and there's stories that nobody else has told. And I'm like, why are we not telling these stories? Why are we telling Chicago stories when Chicago is hours away? We have stories of something that happened down the street that we're not telling. Uh, So I don't know. That's kind of a broad answer to the question. But to me, that's what jumps out is just how many things there are out there that, you know, that we don't think about that are such interesting in in everybody's view of what's interesting is different. Because, again, Mm -hmm. I like boring stuff. But but but, you know, we have all these things right in our neighborhoods that, you know, we don't have to look elsewhere for these great tales. And that's, I think that's a good thing for anybody out there who's interested in, in crime or any kind of history. Your own town, no matter how small it is, I bet it has some horrible crime that happened mm-hmm. that maybe nobody just talks about anymore. So I agree with that. that, that that's logical. I was going to ask you how many, I mean, you, you, you did this research on, on, you know, on the mob in Milwaukee. How many people in Milwaukee, well, I, I, I think you probably don't know this, but, on you know, just 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 uh, just a ballpark, I mean, especially with the younger people, you know, not so much the older folks, but the younger people. How many people are aware that there was such a big mob influence in Milwaukee? I don't think that do many. Think? I don't think that many. I definitely can't give you a number, but I mean, right. I don't think that many. Um, it, full disclosure: I'm not actually from Milwaukee. I am from Wisconsin, but I'm not from Milwaukee. Okay. And but even just being from Wisconsin, it wasn't something that like that. I was aware of it's not really part of our history that that we learn mm-hmm. um people in milwaukee i think are more aware but you're absolutely right uh, like the younger people not so much because uh it's not in the news every day like it used to be for a while there it was it was actually something that everybody in town knew who a couple guys were because it was big news but mm-hmm. that's long gone and but at the same time i also get an interesting resurgence, I think, of interest Mm -hmm. because I get so many people who will come to an event and they'll be like, I knew my grandfather was into something, but my parents would never talk about it. And now, you know, that's starting to come out. And and I love that because the original people aren't going to talk about it. The -hmm. kids might not want to talk about it, whether they're scared or they just didn't know or for whatever reason. But once you get to the, the grandchildren's generation, they're no longer, they don't have a stigma about it. You know, they're genuinely curious about what their grandparents were doing. Okay. So I, I find it interesting that it's actually kind of come around again at a good time. Uh, you know, I can't speak for everybody, but like for me, right. my grandparent if my grandfather had killed a guy and he, and he didn't, and he didn't, but if he did, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel like shame about that. I would just be like, I want to know this story. Whereas I can understand where a child of somebody might feel shame in that, you know, that their parent was a, is a killer. But once you reach that next generation, it's like we're enough removed where we can actually really start looking into this again. So I find that really, that really interesting how often that happens that somebody comes up and they say, yeah, we've heard vague rumors, but we didn't really know until now. Uh, wasn't a part of it that I ever thought was going to be where you know I wasn't doing this to like reunite families with their history. Right. That was never right. in the back of my mind, but it's been a really interesting part of what's come out of it. I bet it has. And to think now, you know, even nowadays, people don't realize that this stuff is still going on, hmm. even though we don't see it. Sure. Yeah, and that's a. That's a sticking point with me, and I know, and I know we're getting to the end of the hour, which is why you brought up the question. No, 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 <laughs> I'm just, I'm just going, I'm just flowing with this. I love it. No, uh, the, it's, a, it's a debate that I have with people all the time. It's about uh-huh. whether this stuff is still going on or not. Yeah. Obviously, it's still going on, whether it's even if it's not by the mob, because uh-huh. there's, there's plenty of, you know, be there motorcycle clubs or you know street gangs or whatever. So like this stuff is always going to be going on, but. Um, but yeah, there's always that debate. Like I have people who come up to me and they're like, I know the mafia is still active in Milwaukee. And, and I'm like, 
maybe I don't see the evidence, but I but I always have to be clear to them that the way that I get my evidence, I don't get things until years after the fact. Right, right, right. So I'm not approaching it as you know as an on the spot journalist. I'm approaching it as a historian. Right. So you know something really bad could be going down right now, sure. but I'm not but I'm not going to know that story for another ten years. So. Uh, so, you know, I, anytime somebody says, I know this stuff is still going on. Right, right. I mean, I don't see it, but I also don't know. I'm not in that position. Right. You know, you, that, you might be a... But that brings me ask, back to what we were talking about before, is that these young young people don't even realize that there was a mob influence, you know, back then, but mm -hmm. they're not realizing it now because they're not seeing it. Now, 30 years from now, like, they'll be sitting like we are. Yeah. And then they'll be discussing it and going, oh, yeah, this this happened when I was, like, 15. Blah 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 blah. This is that's what yeah. I'm trying to make is that you do, people, you know, it's going on around you. You don't realize it's going on around you because they're they're so clandestine about it. No, absolutely, absolutely. And it was it's funny because this is the, kind of off topic, but it's sure. similar to to your point. Um, for for my day job, I actually help people look up history stuff. That is actually what I do day to day. And I was helping a lady who was curious about race relations mm -hmm. in the city that she grew up in and so she was searching the newspaper for race and this and that and things weren't coming up mm -hmm. and and the point you're making is exactly the point that i made to her was nobody realized at the time it was happening that this was a thing i mean now we can we can talk about that we can say oh yeah back then this is how the black community and the white community interacted with each other. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't making headlines on a daily basis because nobody talked about any of that. They didn't realize it was right. an actual, it was a thing. And and that I, I think is what you're saying here is yeah. that, I mean, yeah, there could be any number of things going on just beneath the surface. And, yeah. you know, we, we don't know. It, it'll don't happen know. Yeah. later on. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what do you say to people that uh, I always have this thing? I, I always ask people at the end. Um, I, I even do this as, as a newspaper reporter. You're in Las Vegas, of all places. Okay. You're standing on the corner, and there's a there's a few other guys out there that have books on the same topic as you do. Okay. How do you draw people into reading your stuff? Well, um, lucky for me, I don't actually have that problem because I am the only one writing on Milwaukee. So I've got there that going go. for me. Um, but more broadly speaking, um, I, th I think it's, you know, I think it's fun and it's interesting to read about the other stories. If you're already into true crime, if you're into the mafia stuff, which most people who read my books probably are, I, I can't imagine too many people are just randomly picking it up. I think it's good to explore this because, you know, how many, again, Al Capone and John Gotti, how many Al Capone books are out there? 50? How many John yeah. Gotti books are out there? 20, right. 30? Do I need to buy the same book 30 times and read the same story 30 times? No. I mean, if that's, if you're hardcore love John Gotti fan, I'm not knocking that. I mean, by all means, pick up the newest one. But I think there are some great stories. There's, there's stories out of Wisconsin, the stories out of California, there's stories out of Denver, Colorado. There was even a, a mob in Omaha, Nebraska, of all places. Wow. As, as far as I know, no one's ever written a book on Omaha yet, but I would be the first one in line to read it if they did, because these are the stories that haven't been told. This isn't right. like, let's tell the same story again and again and again. Let's tell a new story. And that's, to, to me, that's my selling point is anything I put in a book is something that you've probably never read anywhere else. So it's it's all new material. It's not the same old story we've been telling for years. So well I agree with you on that. I think that I think I think the stories that's uh, I always love working at, at a small newspaper just for that reason. Because you work at the big newspapers, of course you're gonna be writing about the same stuff, the president of the board, you're gonna be writing about all this stuff. But when you're working mm -hmm. in a small newspaper, you're getting the president of the you you might get the president of the um weed eaters council, or you know, I'm just saying, you know. Sure, and it's, sure. it's, it's, those, it's those little stories within the stories that are interesting. 
So when you look at like what, what, what you're doing with, with looking at the mob in, in, in a smaller, I'm not saying smaller town because because mm-hmm. Wisconsin, you know. No, but, it, is, it is a smaller town. Definitely. Yeah, and something that's not mainstream like New York or Chicago or, or LA, or, you know, I think it's a cool thing because you're able to get those the, those stories that you wouldn't normally hear. No, no, abso- absolutely. Well, absolutely. I would, I'll read the small town books over the big city books any day yeah. of the week because – as a, as a small town guy myself, this is my bias. I'm, I'm sick of New York always having the spotlight. Right. Screw you, New York. You, right. you, you've, you've told all your stories. Let us tell some stories. Because there's things that, that go on, you know, like you say, in, in, in a small arena that doesn't happen in the big arena. Yes. You know what was going on. You know, like you say, the vending machines and, and different other things. So that's what makes it so interesting. That's why I got a hold of you because, you know, it's like I saw that and I thought, wow, yeah. Because, like I said, after finding out what was going on here at the river, which I had no clue, you know, they were mm-hmm. doing that stuff. It's just in, what, what you wrote intrigued me. Well, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate you know, that. To get you on here. You know, I appreciate you coming on. The hour went by really fast. It was fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. I, that was quick. That was a quick hour. How can people get a hold of you? Thank you for asking. Uh, <laughs> I have a fancy, shiny website at milwaukeemafia.com. You can email me, milwaukeemafia at gmail.com. Um, if you go on Facebook, if you're a Facebook person, you can go to facebook.com slash milwaukeemafia. So pretty much if you search Milwaukee Mafia one way or another, you're going to find me. I've done the very best I can to corner the market on that one. So, And how do people find your podcast? Because you, do, you don't only do the one podcast, you do another one too, don't you? I do. I do. See, look at that. You did your research. <laughs> uh, I do. I mean, the primary one, again, is the Milwaukee Mafia podcast, mm-hmm. which you can find through any place you find podcasts, mm-hmm. Apple, Spotify, whatever people are using out there. Um, it's just called Milwaukee Mafia because, again, got a corner of that market. Sure. Uh, and the other one is Fox Cities, Murder and Mayhem. The Fox Cities is an area in Wisconsin that, that I grew up in, um, so it's kind of special to me. Um, it's not going to mean a lot to people who aren't from the area, but, sure. it, but again, if you if you like stories of, of murder and mayhem in a small town, that's what we discuss. We I pick a, a topic – each time, usually it's a murder, not always, mm-hmm. that happened in a, in a small town in the area, and we kind of go through and give a short version of the story. So, uh, yeah, it might not mean anything to you if you're not from the area, but, you know, some people, they love all true crime stories. So Absolutely. You know, See, I definitely. like that. I like all true crime stories. Yeah. So love that stuff. If, if you're one of those people, you know, check it out. It might not matter if you don't know the names of the places. So Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I'd like to get you on another time and talk more about this stuff. I know you've written about Chicago, too. So that would be kind of fun yeah. to talk about, you know, some different expansion. So, um, yeah, I really appreciate you coming on. I learned so much about Wisconsin. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> No, well, I, you know, I appreciate it. I'll, I'd come back any time and say, we did such a such a broad overview tonight. I mean, maybe we yeah. can drill down a little bit next time. But Sure, absolutely. I'm, absolutely. Sitting here, I'm sitting here in my undisclosed location in Wisconsin, and, and in true Wisconsin fashion, we're about an hour away from a snowstorm right now. So, oh, gosh. Yeah, so you, fantastic. We're going to bat down the hashes. All yeah. right, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. You have a good evening. And you as well. Thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. All right, that was a fun interview. You know, I learned a lot about the the, the, the mob. You know, I'm really fascinated with that stuff. You guys know that because I did the whole thing with the Las Ve- with with the Las Vegas casinos a couple months ago. You know, uh, talking about that. Anyway, I want to thank you guys for coming tonight. We got a bunch of stuff coming up tomorrow. We're gonna have uh, we're shifting back into paranormal. We're gonna be talking about uh, Ros the, the Roswell incident. That was the UFOs that crashed in in Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, Greg Larson, or Greg Lawson is going to be with us, and he is going to be show. He, he took a cr- critical look at. It. He looked at the evidence files and, and the forensic files on all that, and, and he's he's come to a conclusion. He, he's a former police officer, and he's come to some conclusions about you know what what happened with Roswell and what's still going on with the stuff that they found at Roswell. So that's going to be a fascinating interview tomorrow, and that'll be at our usual time at 6.30 p.m. Pacific. I want to thank our guest, Gavin Schmidt, for coming on about the Milwaukee Mafia. I definitely want to get him on again because I'd like to pick his brain about some other stuff with the mob as well. But uh, in an hour, we can only do so much, so boom, boom, boom. So <laughs> I, thought, I thought we did pretty good tonight, and I really appreciate him coming on. Um, if you like the show, 
feel free to um, subscribe. Subscribe to our YouTube page. Uh, we're looking for more subscribers. And uh, if you can't find our YouTube page, you know, you can get there from www.CaliforniaHauntsRadio.com. And the video on the front, click on it, take you in. Or you go up to our archives. Our archives go all the way back two years. Uh, for that particular page, and uh, that will take you to all, to all these videos. And if you, if you click on subscribe, that would be great if you liked it. If you did like this, share it with five people. If you hated it, share it with five people. We're equal opportunity here at California Haunts Radio, because we're trying. You know, we, we're, it's 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 a constant thing to get the word out about this, and we want to get the word out about this because we think it's a, it's a pretty darn good show. That's what I think, and I'm just saying that modestly. I can be modest. And if you see that little ticker running at the bottom of the page, that's because California Haunts is a nonprofit organization. So all the costs for this radio show comes out of my pocket, my personal pocket. And if you could donate some uh, cash to us a little bit, you know, uh, even five bucks, every five dollars helps. Help me pay for pay for the internet, and, 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 uh, mics, and other expenses. That would be fantastic because, like I said, it all comes out of my pocket. I enjoy doing this show. I love doing it. Like uh, like I like I think you guys know, I'm a journalist. I'm a journalist, photojournalist, and this is my way of still doing that kind of work in my old age. <laughs> I'm able to, you know, talk with you guys every day and. Uh, bring on some really good guests. So if you could do that, I'd appreciate it. You can do that at paypal.me at California Haunts. Or if you're into Venmo and you don't like PayPal, which is owned by the same company anyway, but if you're into Venmo, all you have to do is go into Venmo and type in California Haunts and you can do it from there. But I would really appreciate it. Again, I want to thank Gavin for coming on because I really, really had a great time with him. And I, I, we are going to get him on again at some point. But uh, I want to thank you guys for coming tonight, and I'm going to go ahead and run the two books for Gavin and the information, his website information. And then I'm going to leave you guys alone. So here we go. And you can get those books through his website, or you can get them, of course, at Amazon.com. Okay, well, I want to, th again, thank you guys, and thank Gavin, and thank everybody for coming. I really appreciate it. And I will be back here tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. Pacific. I was going to say Pacific. And uh, I will see you guys, okay? Have a good one.